Welcome to the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast. Welcome to a gathering of Skalds. Today I am delighted to welcome Woody Pather, author of Mythic Tales Retold. This week the podcast is two years old, and the time has really flown by. My sincere thanks to each and every one of you for supporting everything we do at Myth, Legend and Lore. I think this gathering is going to encourage a smile, to pause our day for a moment and feel the fire of curiosity that burns in every one of us. Mythic Tales Retold is a wonderful collection of myths from around the world, and written with skill, humour and such creativity. The research undertaken, the use of limerick style, and well-placed modern references make this such an impressive book. Before I hand you over to Woody, I've asked his permission to share these lines from chapter 12, Yggdrasil and Midgard. Now Yggdrasil was the world ash tree, with her roots being gnawed annoyingly. The world serpent beneath the sea was behaving, well, serpently, being a child of Loki. Now Yggdrasil being the centre of the cosmos was where the gods produced their logos. They assemble beneath her shade, and policy is made to fight the forces of chaotic chaos. Without further ado, please welcome Woody to a gathering of Skalds. Hi, my name is Woody. I'm the author of the book Mythic Tales Retold. I'm grateful to Siobhan for allowing me this opportunity to tell you more about the book and myself. I've always been intrigued by the facts surrounding our existence, and I suppose that's what makes us human. We don't know whether other living things ponder matters such as why they exist, their destiny, whether there's a life after death, and so on. I think that a certain degree of intelligence is required for these sorts of questions, and that is probably the reason why myths and folklore tales arose. We have such a rich trove of these stories from all over the world, and some of them have been so ingrained that they inform our way of life. In other words, they are part of us, and we even form religions around them. My book attempts to engage a reader in a more playful manner, although at times it does get a bit serious, sometimes biting, depending on what's bothering my conscience or sensibilities at the time. I do, however, want the reader to be entertained while being informed, and to view the old myths from new angles. I'd like now to read out chapter 5 called Chaos and Gaia. I do not despair, for in Kronos, another tale will order chaos. I'll tell my tale, no holy grail, and dispel all Erebos. It begins with yawning, voided chaos, all alone with no cosmos. But then came Gaia, the primordial lover, with Nyx and Tartarus and Erebos and Eros. Well, actually, Ursa Major couldn't bear the quiet and harped on chaos day and night. So chaos relented and consented for music to finally see the light. To harp sonata number eight in F major, strung string theory all together, when Giovanni, Francesco, Giuliani, in perfect harmony, made the silence far less quieter. Then chaos revised a theory and made the silence far less eerie. So Gaia was born at break of dawn to dictate Hestia's theogony. Then Tartarus and Nix got together and made bright day and airy aether. So when they paired, E equaled MC squared, and lo, everything got brighter. 
and Gaia birds domed Uranus, who covered each groove and sinus. Wide-bosomed Gaia, the fecund mother, bred both her sons and lovers. Thus too did David Herbert Lawrence, with his foreign lover in Florence, conceive a book with gobbledygook and smudged incoherence. The coupling of Uranus and Gaia produced no hematospermia, but the Paul-based children, Uranus became villain and locked them deep and yonder. Now that Uranus was a pain in the arse, Gaia devised a farce. And at the Mentine Sickle, there was no nickel, son Cronus directed and Tros. The blood from his wound spawned the Furies, and giants, nymphs, and other worries, and Aphrodite from the sea, all to feature in future movies. Among his children were also the Titans, who looked like Marvel's Inhumans. The Titans offspring, no kidding, were various and scary specimens. There was bright and shiny Helios, a son who never lost his gloss, and Mooney Selene with a cheesy mien, and others like Atlas and Eos. From my Hyperion Athea came Helios, beaming bright and grandiose, and in the morn, at break of dawn, was born the lovely Eos. From Iapetus and Clymene came Atlas, and Prometheus and Minutius, and as afterthought, a stupid sort in Clueless Epimetius. Later, Atlas had a weight on his shoulder when he bore the brunt of Zeus's anger. He held up high the mess of sky for eternity and forever. Atlas, mapped out like a rump, felt his shoulder growing numb. But with no latitude, he began to brood. How to rub my shoulder with my thumb? If only Mercator were around, a simple solution could be found. He'd scale my height, project my plight, and make me go eastbound. Cronus then lay with Titan Rhea, but swallowed each child of his sister. So Rhea devised a ruse, which saved her babe Zeus, who later became the all father Zeus. When he grew up, planned revenge, with feats emulated at Stony Stonehenge. After defeating Cronus, imprisoned him at Tartarus, which looked like a rhombic lozenge. Says with the aid of Metis, the daughter of seafaring Oceanus, made Cronus regurgitate while in a drunken state, all six his children and sea letters. In a mighty battle with giants and titans, rises a story where suspense heightens. So I'll cut it short and report. Seus becomes ruler of all Olympians. But this story is a long-drawn matter with Hades and Hera, Hestia and Demeter and Percon and Apollon and Poseidon. So no peeking at the next chapter. Now, the first man ever was named Pelasgus, and though Autochthonus aimed quite high and near the sky, found holy Mount Olympus. There reigned thunderous Zeus with some of his produce, while in India, as Dyer's Peter, he hummed the Himalayas. And when it comes to mentioning facts, they'll say you're wrong by quoting Acts, for in 148 to 13 and 28 11, the God of heaven is viewed without parallax. Zeus was born on the island Crete without its basidiomycete, but strong as an oak, he was a bloke who always wore the laurel wreath. And lovers he worn by the dozen, like Leda and Namuzin, disguised as a satyr or a vulture, he'd have his way with women. But with the daughter of Nereus, he met his nemesis. For no Achilles heel had Tatus, who thwarted his advances and sidestepped mighty Zeus. Zeus, displaying cunning intelligence, though filled with belligerence, swallowed Matus. Now there'd be no Katniss, with an appetite for resistance. Zeus made sure he'd never see the day he'd have to hear the mocking jay. No insurrection from child or brethren, now with Matus as CIA. 
Because the titan Prometheus had angered the mighty Zeus, he sent a flood of water and mud that went on a titanic cruise. But Deucalion and Pyrrha built an oak like Noah. The water subsided, they alighted, terror so less firmer. So off to Delphi they hastened, now being properly chastened. They prayed to Titan Themis for things we miss, and offered a cow hastily basted. They were told to throw some bones, to make some human clones. So humanity got rebooted, but remained stupid, as revealed in fossil stones. Now Zeus devised a ruse that shocks, and gives Pandora an unjovial box. It's really a jar, pithos, for rice or wine or sauce, and hopes for a move unorthodox. Pandora's story I'll relate shortly, with freedom, joy, and harmony, peace, word, and fairness, security and happiness, and of course, mercy. Now Probatus, without forethought, thought he'd not get caught. He stole some fire, fanned Zeus's ire, then Zeus delivered his wrath. He chained Prometheus to a mountain, cutting his chest wide open. Imagine the pain without Novocaine. So did Zeus punish sin. Then Zeus took his mighty eagle, not to make a swooping kill, but to savor the exposed liver and to feast to his fill. But the organ grew back again, for the eagle to cause more pain. And for thousands of years, and in his theodic verse, repeated without refrain. If only Prometheus had not stolen from the funnel stalk, or gone instead for a walk, killed an ox or planted flocks, Zeus would have used a hawk. Now Hera, jealous of Hubby's mistresses, was tearing out her dresses. For Zeus, by employing the nymph Echo, had kept her mellow while doing his lusty business. But Hera wasn't fooled for long and came back with a mighty thong. The luckless Echo dealt a resounding blow, ping-pong far as Hong Kong. That bounds a thought for poor Echo, who's so acoustically low. But Hera's curses and scornful Narcissus, doomed to fade without a bow. Narcissus, a fellow who was so beautiful, his fame doubled to Istanbul. But at a pool was made a fool because he'd been so cruel. Narcissus, in love with the pool's reflection, resounded aloud his adoration. But the face below gave hollow echo. It was face-to-face -face rejection. And then his love grew oh so vegetatively, nourished by his own vanity. Losing reality, not sanity, was the punishment of Aphrodite. For those of you who do not know, Narcissus turned pale yellow. Hour by hour, he became a flower and a Vincent van Gogh tableau. Perhaps the poor fellow should have been a weeping willow. Then he could see, until eternity, his face in the pool below. But now his face had to face the sun and burn like a hot cross bun. For without a ship hole or drop of snow, it surely couldn't be fun. Now Nemesis is the other face kept in Aphrodite's case. She exacts vengeance in this resemblance. So. Stay in your hiding place. Yes, Nemesis, enraged by Narcissus when he succumbed to hubris, ensured his arrogance and ignorance would never bring him bliss. From this we learn, and doubly so, from the tale of poor Echo, that a double face brings disgrace and murders itself in woe. Pandora, the first woman, was fashioned by Hephaestus and became the wife of Epimetheus, the brother of Prometheus, whose fiery ruse angered the mighty Zeus. It was the daughter of Pandora, the lovely Pyrrha, who fostered humanity. With much gravity, men Zeus flooded all terra firma. After landing on Mount Parnassus, according to Horace, she had sons and daughters grandsons Doris and Aeolus and many others. Now Zeus misused all giving Pandora when he gave her that evil jar. 
It had more viruses and vices that you'd find in a police car. It was a husband, the miserable myope, who was the actual dope. Now we have to cope without much hope, with evil like Trump, the misanthrope. Yet there are other tales to relate when divining the gods' fate. I'll do my best, as you'll attest, and try not to grate or irritate. Hephaestus, the blacksmith, though forged imperfectly, was the god of sculptors, craftwork, and metallurgy. Being shoulder at foot, Hera gave him the boot. Her motherly love was a deformity. Hera, as you will recall, drove poor Echo up the wall, a matronly figure, yet poor mother. Her deeds resounded in every hall. Hephaestus crafted Hermes's sandal and Aphrodite's famed girdle. His work was perfect, without effect. Is disability a scandal? How often are our arguments lame to discard those who are not the same? Their imperfection invites rejection. Our perfect natures are to blame. After that, Cronus was defeated, disquieted, depleted, and almost deleted. Sons, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, without the ladies, discussed matters quite unheeded. Days was the boss, though the others got cross. But crossing the man was no way a plan, so you just had to accept your loss. Hades would go down, down under. At that stage, it wasn't Australia. Poseidon would get the sea, a holy sea for this beastie, and Zeus the remaining remainder. Now for each son, there is many a tale I'd like in time to unveil. But for now, take a bow. Let's see Poseidon sail. In pursuit of Sister Demeter was Poseidon, but concealed as a stallion. She'd become a mare to avoid his stare, but still got raped with abandon. After his adventure with his sister, he went in pursuit of Medusa in the Temple of Athena. On the floor, he raped her, and later, she became the monster. So offended was Athena by Poseidon's latest caper. To use a temple floor for one more score put her in awful temper. So she gave the luckless Medusa the petrifying power. Skin and bone would turn to stone, as geologists now discover. But Medusa had a stony stare. So you had to gaze with care. But terrified and petrified, you'd turn to glazed stoneware. So even now, as was then, the blame falls on the woman. The men go free with no penalty, and so the raped are raped again. American author Elizabeth Johnston compares Medusa to Hillary Clinton. For a strong woman, is perceived demon, when in fact she is an icon. Poseidon was so lecherous, he raped, disguised as Anipius, the wife of poor Criteus. He raped Cronaeus. His rapes indeed were numerous. If only Athena had gone to Delphi, she would have changed what couldn't be, changed the Gorgon, so Poseidon would be a rocked and stoned city. But what the gods can't foretell doesn't suit us very well. With foresight, we'd see at night, and so avoid our hell. But for now, you'll have to encounter others like El and Ahura Mazda. So while the plot thickens like Charlie Dickens, I'll have to keep you a wee bit longer. If you've read Oliver Twist, you're bound to get the thematic gist. But a tale of two cities, as in times of ditties, takes more time than a flick of the wrist. Thank you for listening, and thanks once again to Siobhan for giving me this great opportunity. Please follow me on Instagram at Woody Puther and on Twitter at Puther Woody. My book, Mythic Tales, is available to buy on Rakuten Kobo as an ebook and it is optimized for reading on your laptop or e-reader. Please look forward to my forthcoming books. Meandering will be out in November, and the other book will be in due course. Thank you once again.
Thank you so much, Woody, for your reading today. It was absolutely marvellous. And please, do come back in the future. If you have enjoyed this reading, then pop on over to Kobo, where you can find Mythic Tales Retold by Woody Pather. It's gathered some fantastic reviews already. In a couple of days, we will upload the video for this gathering onto the Myth, Legends and Lore YouTube channel. And please do reach out to Woody. You can find him on Twitter at PatherWoody. As always, links will be included in the show description over on Podbean. Special thanks also go to Thishira from Legendary Africa Podcast. If you have a wee moment, please check this podcast out. It's available on all platforms. It has a website where you can find Thishira on Twitter at LegendaryPod1. Based in South Africa and covering the myths, legends and lore of Africa, every episode is so well produced, researched and always fascinating. Thishira is a great friend, but more than that, she is a very proud sister and daughter. Thank you, Woody and Tashira, for making today's episode such a special one. But for now, take care, and thank you for joining A Gathering of Scalds. I'm Siobhan Clark, and you've been listening to the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast. <laughs>